Uh, tonight we're talking with Muslim perspectives about Christmas. Uh, before I actually get into the topic, there's a couple of remarks I want to make. Number one, uh, this particular issue is deeply sensitive to so many people, both Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, so and a lot of our Muslim brothers and our non-Muslim brothers and sisters will fall in a different level of spectrum of you know, um, different varying perspectives and practice of this particular um, issue. I want to say, first of all, that whatever I say tonight, um, do not take it personal uh, and understand that we are trying to learn. And, and I am giving one perspective, uh, which I think is from the Islamic perspective. You're always free to differ with me and to debate and discuss and for us to, um, you know, come to understandings or clarify things further. That is why we allow questions at the end of all of our sessions to allow students to who may have a different point of view or may um, want to add to the discussion. Now, depending upon where you were born or how you grew up, Christmas is a, a practice that is so pervasive in the society that almost everyone knows about it. It is considered the best holiday uh, that people um, commemorate and celebrate. Um, for Muslims growing up in the Caribbean uh, or in the Western environment, uh, Trinidad, Guyana, and so on, uh, Christmas represents a kind of a nostalgia because many of our parents uh, who are not as educated about Islam uh, practice some form of Christmas in our homes. And so a lot of us in our childhood, we grew up with some of these practices as part of the norm for Christmas. <clears throat> you will find in a lot of Muslim homes, we'll have Christmas trees and we will um, exchange gifts and we will do in, in Guyana, uh, they make pepper pot uh, Christmas morning, which is a special Guyanese dish and so on. And so for a lot of um, Muslims growing up in the Caribbean, this is something that they are attached to. Uh, the other reason why people get connected to this is that sometimes people are worried about what others will say. And so if they don't do anything for Christmas, they worry people may say something or, or look down upon them. Uh, the pervasiveness of this holiday is such that everyone gets affected. Even our class, we're taking three weeks off. And the reason is really because we want to accommodate people who may be traveling with their families, and going out of tongue and all of these different things. So um, so even our class gets affected by this holiday. Uh, Christmas is presented as a time of fun and family and shopping and, and joy. Uh, and it's uh, goodwill, peace on earth and goodwill and those kinds of um, wonderful uh, qualities and feelings. And... <clears throat> For a lot of our, our brothers and sisters who are Muslims, uh, it becomes very difficult to uh, keep away from Christmas a lot of times. And so um, we are going to look at it from you know different aspects tonight. And I want to say after tonight's class, if you were one of those who was very big into Christmas, or you know of other fellow Muslims and sisters who are big into Christmas, and you come to the idea that this is not something that we need to do, I don't want you to go out and start harassing fellow Muslims. This is how do you have a, a big tree in your house? Or how do you do this? Or how do you... Please don't do that. Right? This is information we're providing as students of knowledge in our class, not for us to go out and harass people and to, to make them feel uncomfortable. This is not the way you do dawah. And so this is not the way we would go about it. That's why when, when the kids are learning karate or one of those martial arts, the teacher will tell them, this is not for you to go out and start beating up people. You know, so <clears throat> we have to be mindful of this. And so let's begin this little journey we have here tonight. Um, so first of all, we want to understand some basic precepts and concepts about our religion, Islam. Because we always have to start there. What is our foundation for judging anything? Allah is the one who gives us our morals. Allah is the one who gives us our standards. Allah is the one who gives us our values. Allah is the one who gives us how 
and the right and the wrong and the good and the bad of how we must conduct our lives. So we must begin by understanding these basic precepts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his religion has provided. So one of the ayats that Allah mentioned, وَأَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرُهُ عَلَىٰ دِينِ كُلِّ وَكَفَىٰ بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا It is Allah who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth to make it prevail over all other ways of life. And Allah suffices as witness. So here in this verse from the Quran, Allah is telling us that Islam is truth. And it can only be one fundamental truth. You can't have two equally valid truths. So if one group says A and the other one says B, only one can be true. And so Allah is telling us that he has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth. And so for us, Islam represents truth, which means anything that contradicts with Islam, we reject or we don't participate in it. The second thing that I want you to know is uh, the position of associating partners with Allah is one of the greatest act of oppression and transgression against Allah. Look, man, when he talked to his son, he says, Ya bunayya la tushrik billah. Inna shirka la zulmun azim. That, oh, my son, do not associate anything with Allah, but verily, that shirk or associating partners with Allah, zulmun azim, translated as a terrible wrong, but it is really literally means it is the greatest oppression. Right? Zulm is oppression. <clears throat> and so Luqman is letting us know in Allah, is letting us know in the Quran that shirk and associating any partners with Allah is considered one of the greatest. Uh, that's the only sin that Allah, if you don't ask for forgiveness for, that Allah will not forgive you for it. Other sins you commit and you forget to ask for forgiveness, Allah may forgive you for it, even though you didn't ask. But shirk, you can't go to Allah with this. Thirdly, when the Prophet, when the Quraysh came, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the Quraysh, he was preaching the Islam and the Quraysh wanted to find a way to work with the Prophet. And so they came to him and they said, you know, we need to really find a way that all of us will be happy. So how about we make a deal where we will worship your God for one day and then you worship our God for one day and everybody will be happy. You know, so, and then Allah revealed the Quran in this surah. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا بَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلَيَدِينَ And Allah instructed the Prophet, say, O disbelievers, I don't worship what you worship, nor do you worship what I worship. Nor do I serve what you serve, nor do you serve what I serve. You have your way, and I have my way. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ was unable to make a compromise with people who are worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was no compromise. It's not that, you know, I can just compromise, I worship your God to make peace. No. He came with a clear message that this is not deserving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's one of the rights of Allah that you should worship him. And so this was rejected. And when the Muslims conquered Makkah, you know, after they chased him out of Mecca, uh, 10 years he was in Medina, and then uh, finally the Prophet ﷺ returned to Mecca, and they conquered Mecca. At that time, the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't seek revenge. He forgave everybody. But one of the things he did was he cleared the house, the Kaaba, of all the hundreds of idols that they had there. There was no compromise with this. He didn't say, well, you know, the people there are worshipping idols. You know, how are we destroying their religion? You know, maybe we should build a, a small shed or a small hut or a small temple where they could still continue to worship their idols. No. It was an uncompromising decision. All the idols need to be removed. This is the right of Allah, and we are not accommodated that. So he was very strong with us when it comes to this. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions as well in the Quran that when truth has come, 
falsehood will vanish. It will be van vanquished away. For falsehood is bound to wither away. In al batila kana zahuka, that when when truth comes, batil goes away. And so we we do believe that we cannot mix truth with falsehood. And then uh, part of our religion is to cooperate on principles, not cooperate with organizations or peoples or countries. The Muslims we cooperate on principles. So if someone uh, is willing to establish a particular principle and we agree with that principle, we work with them. Even though we don't agree with their lifestyle, their religion or whatever, but on the issue of the project that is based on a particular um, theme that both of us agree with, we can work with other groups. That's why when your neighborhood, in your neighborhood, they're building a bridge or they're fixing a road or they ask you to cooperate on that project, yes, we can do it. Even though your neighbor may be an atheist, we don't say, oh, you're an atheist. We don't talk to you. We don't do nothing with you. No, we always cooperate on principles. That we cooperate with one another on righteousness and piety. And we don't cooperate with one another in sin and hostility. So this is part of the uh, Islamic way of how we interact and relate with others based on principles. And then we have two broad categories of actions. One is called worships and one is called conducts. Non-worship, if you may want to call it that. The, the category of worship, like Salah, Zakah, Saum, Hajj, uh, those things, everything you do there has to have a proof. You can't make up anything. We are not like some other groups where they just make up things to worship. Very specific Salah, very two salat or uh, two rakah fajr and so on. Everything is laid out. Fasting, same thing. You can't just fast any month you decide. Everything is has a proof and it has a ruling, an evidence for it. Whereas in the non-worship category, everything is allowed unless you can find something prohibiting it. And so things like commemorating holidays and various events, you know, celebrating the, the uh, graduation of your child and all of that come under a non-worship category. And so those things are allowed, driving a car, having air condition, drinking coconut water. None of those are found in the Syria of the Prophet Wasallam, but they're all allowed because it comes in a non-worship category called Mu'amilat. And so everything is allowed in that category unless you have a prohibition. So we use cell phones and all the others. And then the Prophet ﷺ was very keen in letting us know the one who imitates others, those other than us in faith and religious rituals, in religion, is not from among us. Do not imitate the Jews and the Christians. He who imitates any people in their actions is considered one of them. And so for a Muslim, uh, we are very careful. We don't just blindly imitate aspects of another person's religion or culture because we have our own. We have our guidance from Allah. We have our truth from Allah who has given us answers to every aspect of our lives. And so that is a caveat I want to begin by reminding us about these. I know all of you know all of these things already. We have covered them in many, many other classes. But this is a foundational precept that I want to begin with before we go into um, further. So now we have this figure which is common to Christians and common to Muslims. And that is Jesus, Isa alayhi salam. And so when we examine the life of Isa and the beliefs of Muslims and the beliefs of Christians regarding this uh, very uh, important and famous prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find that there are some common beliefs and there are different beliefs about each other. So this is a small uh, Venn diagram that gives us a little idea of it. So the common beliefs we have with Christians about Jesus is that he did not commit sin. He had a virgin birth, Mary, his mother. Uh, he performed miracles with the permission of Allah. It's called the word of Allah. will return 
uh, was not killed nor crucified, but he was raised up to Allah and will return back and live a regular life and then die. <clears throat> and he was known as the Messiah. There's a little bit of difference of how the Christians, what they interpret Messiah to be compared to the Muslims. And so these are the common beliefs between Jews, I mean Muslims and Christians. Now the Muslims, they have a further belief that is different from the Christian. Number one, we believe he's a revered prophet. Whereas the Christians believe that he was a son of God incarnate. So we have a difference. You know, we don't believe that Jesus was a son of God. Secondly, that he was never crucified. The Christians believe he was crucified and saved and resurrected as well. We believe he was taken up to Allah and that he was a Messiah sent to the Jews only. In their Bible, he said, Jesus said, I have not been sent except to the Jews. So our belief is that only the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, proclaimed that he was sent to all mankind. All the previous prophets came to their own people. And so we believe Jesus, as was mentioned in the, the Bible, that um, which we don't accept the Bible as being the real uh, revelation that was sent to Jesus. And Christians, they believe he was God's son. He was a savior to the world, came to save the whole of humanity. He was crucified, and then he was resurrected. Uh, he's part of a triune God in which you have God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And so they believe that these three gods or entities are three, but they are one at the same time. And Christians always find it difficult to explain this, of how can something be three at the same time, independent entities, and yet be one entity. Um, and so sometimes they say it's a mystery. Sometimes they try to use an egg as a way of illustrating it. You see the egg has the yolk, the shell, and the whites. And so it's three, but it's only one egg um, and stuff like that. And then the Messiah for the whole world, they believe that he came for the whole world. So these are the basic uh, common beliefs and different beliefs between Jesus and Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran this beautiful verse, O people of the book, which is the Jews and the Christians, do not exceed the limits in your religion and do not say anything except the truth about Allah. Verily, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah and a fulfillment of Allah's word, which he sent down to Mary and a mercy from him. So believe in Allah and his messenger, and do not say they are three. Desist. It, is, it will be better for you. Verily, Allah is the only, is only one God. Far is it from his holiness that he should have a son. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. And Allah is sufficient as a guardian. What a beautiful verse, bringing the whole matter in a, in a perspective that is truly wonderful. And so now we'll begin to look at the issue of Christmas. So we'll start by looking at what the Christian's perspective on Christmas is, <clears throat> or how they um, understand Christmas. Right away we have problems in that for some strange reason, you have to understand what happened with Christianity in that the Christians, they were being persecuted by the Roman who was a superpower at that time. And the Romans, they uh, they persecuted the, the Christians and they couldn't find a way to, to make any ground until one of the prominent Romans, Constantinople, accepted Christianity. And so as a ruler now, he was able to give power to the Christians. And so they, for the first time, they had an opportunity to bring their religion into the public arena. But a lot of compromises were made because Constantinople coming from a pagan background of believing in idols and, and worshiping different kinds of things, tried to, to cement the two, 
the Christian teachings and the, the pagan teachings and try to fuse them into one uh, cohesive mixture that everybody will be happy. And to some extent, some of the Christians, in order to, to have peace and to survive, they compromised some of their teachings and practiced some of the Roman pagan teachings with full knowledge uh, in order to be able to have uh, to get favor and to be able to um, get a chance to survive and thrive. And so, firstly, one of those things which fell under that was Christmas. In the Gospels, there is no date of Jesus' birth. You know, the early Christians, they didn't have any interest in the birth of Jesus. They didn't celebrate. They didn't commemorate. They had no interest. And then about three centuries after Jesus' birth, when many of the things happened, uh, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman emperor. Empire, and this was when it gets first celebrated because now we had it coming in, and Christmas actually became popular around eight hundred of the Christian era, when Charlie Main was crowned emperor of the Roman Empire on Christmas Day. So to appease the 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 the, uh, the pagans, the early church leaders assimilated some of these practices into the Christmas festivities. Uh, before Jesus was even born, pagan Europe used to celebrate the winter solstice. In Scandinavia, the Norse people used to celebrate the Yule, the winter solstice, where fathers and sons would bring home logs and, and trees, which they would set them afire to keep warm. The Romans would celebrate the birthday of Mitra, which was their sun god on the 25th of December. And Mitra was birthday was considered one of the holiest and most sacred days of the year. And according to Scottish anthropologist uh, James Fraser, he said, you know, it was the custom of the heathen to celebrate on the same 25th of December, the birthday of the sun to which they kindle lights in a token of festivity. And so uh, the Christians begin to slowly adapt making that particular holiday um, the birth of Jesus so they could have one day in which everybody could celebrate. All right, the, This monk Dionysus, he fixed the date as 25th of the birthday of Jesus. He said, Jesus birthday is 25th. So now both the pagans and the Christians could have a unity and they all could join in the festivity. And so began this picking this date of 25th of December. But we learned from the Bible itself that said that Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. He, she wrapped him in clothes, cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping a watch over their flocks at night. So here we see that Mary, the Bible is telling us that Mary got birth to him on a manger, which uh, usually 25th of December is very cold in Bethlehem. It's around uh, 39 to 41 degrees, very cold. And it rains about 11 days in the December in that particular region. It would be inconceivable to think that Mary would place this baby in that cold environment. Uh, in a manger at that time of the year. And so uh, Christian scholars have opined that this could not have been the real date when Jesus would born, was born. Also, it was reported that Mary, was, when she was pregnant, she traveled like 100 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem which is inconceivable for her to do that in cold weather as a pregnant woman. It is, so it's highly unlikely that that was the case. Some of the Christian scholars have said it's most likely that he was born around late September, which was the time of the annual feasts, uh, when traveling like this was much more common. And we also learned from the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and so she conceived him and withdrew with him to a remote place. 
and the pains of childhood drove her onto the trunk of a palm tree. She said, oh, would that I had died before this and had become a thing quite forgotten. Then he called her from beneath her, grieve not. This was the angel, thy Lord has placed a rivulet below thee and shake towards thyself the trunk of the palm tree. It will cause ripe dates to fall upon thee. And we, of course, know that ripe dates don't bear on those trees in Palestine at that time of the year. So it's more likely that Jesus, the, the best guess that they have, he was born between July to October, somewhere around there, right? There's another problem in that Christians, they actually have two calendars. So you had the Julian calendar after Julius Caesar, uh, and then this calendar was adopted. And then later on, they found that uh, this Julian calendar was causing problems with the dates. It was causing their holidays to get messed up. And so Pope Gregory the Thirteenth decides that he's going to make a new calendar, which we now call the Gregorian calendar. And that's the one that we follow today. Uh, but the Julian calendar is still followed by Orthodox Christians almost 260 million followers. The problem is that these two calendars don't have the dates lined up exactly. And so the there is a difference of 13 days. And so you find some of these Christians who continue to follow the Julian calendar, they, um, they celebrate Christmas on January the 7th. So you have some Christians, the majority of the Christians celebrated on the 25th of December, and then the next set of them celebrated on January the 7th, and all the Christian, the prominent historians and scholars says Jesus was born between July to October. So this is the first literal problem we have with this particular holiday. Secondly, there are a lot of Christian groups who don't commemorate Christmas at all. The Jehovah's Witness is one of the biggest groups that do not celebrate Christmas. And they said because it was not mentioned in the Bible, the word Christmas is not mentioned in the Bible. And so they consider that this holiday is not uh, important. And so they um, do not celebrate it. We have the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They also said, we do not celebrate Christmas as the birth of Christ since he was not born in December. Uh, and they said, we don't want to celebrate his birth because he has not told us when he was born. And so they consider it a pagan ritual. You have the deeper life. And there are many, many groups. Pastor Kumui, which is the head of that church, he said, we don't celebrate Christmas nor sing Christmas carols. Because Christmas is of an idolatrous background, right? The God's Kingdom Society, the church official website says they believe that there's no evidence that Jesus Christ was born on the 25th of December. They have the Quakers, which a lot of them are found in Africa, in Kenya, probably have the largest group. And they said every day is a holy day. So we don't single out a specific day for. So you have now. Some Christians celebrating on 25th, some 7th, and some not celebrating at all. Right? Then linked in with Christmas is many other practices we mentioned that came from pagan background. One of it is this Santa Claus, you know, that gets tied to Christmas. There's only the only time Santa Claus comes is at Christmas time. So it's directly tied into Christmas. And the word Santa Claus is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. And this was a story born where there was a guy named St. Nick. He was a bishop and he was born like 300 years after Jesus. And according to the legend, he used to go out at night and he would distribute presents to people who are in need. And then after he died, they began to commemorate his, he died on like the 6th of December. They commemorated his death. school boys in Europe would go and they would celebrate the, every year the anniversary of the death of this um, saint. 
And then Queen Victoria later changed the celebration to the 24th of December, Christmas Eve. And the people who have articulated most the image that you see of Santa Claus was done by a Coca-Cola hired an artist named Haddon Sunblum. And so he drew Santa Claus as a white bearded gentleman dressed in red suit and a black belt and a white fur trim, black boots and a soft cap, red cap. And that became the popular image of Santa Claus. And so the idea being that Santa Claus will come on Christmas Eve and children are taught this lie from very young that on Christmas Eve, Santa Claus is going to come down the chimney and then he is going to bring presents for you. He lives in the North Pole. He travels on some sleigh with deers flying in the sky and so on. And so um, kids are socialized in that way of this particular lie of how they get presents. Attached also to Christmas was the Christmas tree. You know, um, the Bible itself condemns this. The customs of the people are worthless. The Bible says the customs of the people are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adore it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so it will not totter. You know, so the Bible calls this a worthless custom. You know, and so we have from the, the Christian sources themselves a practice which they do, which is not con, con, uh, uh, sanctioned by the Bible. They are just the earliest legend of the, the Christmas tree. It goes way back, you know, that where Christians began to, to use it as a symbol was 723 when St. Boniface, he was, he was giving uh, evangelizing in Germany and he saw that the people there, the pagan people, they had a custom where they would dance around a tree decorated and they would sacrifice a baby in the name of Thor, the god Thor. And so when he came, he saw they were doing this and he took an axe and he chopped the tree down with one blow and it was an oak tree and the, to the crowd's amazement, the tree fell um, and then a small baby tree was there behind it or around it. And he said, let this tree now become the symbol for God. And its leaves should be evergreen and will not die. And that the needles of the tree points it to heaven and it is shaped in a triangular to form to represent the Holy Trinity. And so what he did was that he, he took this pagan practice and he tried to make it become a symbol that will represent God, the Trinity, and, and make it a, a something special for the people. And then later on, whilst they're doing this, they used to they place a star symbolizing the star of Bethlehem on top of this ring. Um, so right now, when people have Christmas, you you go if you go take a little drive, you will see in front of Lowe's or in different places. The guys who sell Christmas trees, they are camped down there for two weeks you know, until Christmas. From Thanksgiving to Christmas, they build a huge tent and they have all these trees there. And they have a little RV that they live in literally and they sell trees. You know, So um, it is a widely practiced um, that you cut down this tree and then you recreate them in your homes. It truly has nothing to do with Christian faith and belief. Added to that, there was another practice which is popular at Christmas time, and that is to hang stockings. Um, this was, you know, um, a practice that went back as far as 1823, and literally, um, the the idea was that stockings would be hung over the fireplace, and that you know Santa Claus would come and stuff those stockings with with presents and so on. And the, the, the story behind it, or the, the alleged story, is that there was a poor man, um, and he had three daughters. He was worried about them because he didn't had he could hardly make ends meet. He used to worry whether they would get married and who they would marry to. And Saint Nick, who used to wonder, as we mentioned before, 
he found out that the man was, you know, very poor. And so he slid down the chimney of the family house and he filled the, the stockings of the girls. The father had said, look, just put up some stockings. Maybe God will bless us and, you know, and bring something for us. So they had the stockings. So when he went, he found the stockings and he put placed some gold coins into the stockings. And so um, when the girls woke up, the father, they were like amazed uh, to get all of this gold in their stocking and they became rich. They were able to wear, they were able to um, have a better life. Um, later on, this culture gets changed to not stockings. So people now stock mostly because in wintertime, fresh fruit was hard to get. And so the most popular fruit that was put in the stockings was oranges because they look like gold coins um, and they were placed there. Um, I don't quite know what America now does in terms of this particular practice. Um, I know now this has been replaced with socks and different kinds of um, things, but this is all part of that festival. So again, a lot of the origin of the practices of uh, this holiday is not based on Christian values or Christian origin. Uh, and so we as Muslims now, now comes Christmas time and we encounter this holiday. So what are we to do and how are we to deal with it? Now, first of all, we are not allowed to participate in any kind of activity. As we said, we participate based on principle. And activities that are based, have a shirk or a idolatry-based practices, we are not as Muslims allowed to participate in them. As I mentioned in the beginning of the topic, this is one of a very big sin and we have to be very careful we don't get involved in this. We must protect our faith and values at all costs. And we, in order to navigate the relationship with our Christian brothers and sisters, you know, we have to be very careful how do we do that. Um, but one of the things that we must know, we should try to keep away from the Christmas environment as much as possible and keep the relationship with our non-Muslim friends and families as much as we can without compromising our values. And that's not an easy thing to do, right? And we should begin to educate non-Muslims just as they don't participate in our holidays. You know, they don't come out and day and all of that you know so we need to educate them that we have our own religious holidays you know and it's not and not participating in Christmas doesn't mean that we are rejecting their values or we are anti-social you know so we've got to navigate that very tough thing because they are the majority in the society and every time you have a minority set of people this is always the problem the dominant culture dictates the order of the day and so the the lesser culture finds it sometimes very difficult to um, adopt principal stands. <clears throat> uh, in order to help our young people, the Muslim community should organize alternative programs, not celebrating Christmas, but to gather the community into meaningful, maybe fun-oriented programs for the youth so that they can come to the masjid and be in an environment that is not um, based on shirk. Now, at Christmas, we have this issue of gifts, because one of the things we will get, we'll receive gifts. Our Christian brothers and friends will give us gifts. The general principle, according to our scholars, is that we can receive gifts from the Muslims in general. And we have many, many, many incidents, instances of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu receiving gift. You know, Caesar offered a gift to the Prophet and he accepted. Kaiser offered a gift and he accepted. Other kings offered him gifts and he accepted them. Ali accepted gifts from non-Muslims on the day of their festivities, the day of Nowruz, he accepted a gift. Aisha accepted a gift from the Zoroastrians, was a kind of a food, was a vegetarian type food. So it is permissible as per our scholars that we can accept gifts from non-Muslims even on their day of festivity. And the basic principle is that it's permissible to accept that. Uh, accepting the gift is an act of kindness and it, it builds a relationship. Now, after getting the gift, you take the gift. It turns out that the gift is haram in nature. For example, sometimes people will give you alcohol. 
you know, a bottle of champagne or something. Um, or you might have gift in which you get food that is haram food, right? Um, or you get a gift in which you have like a cross with Jesus on it or something like that. Some gift which and our current our religion is not considered halal, then you should try to find a way to get 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 rid of that gift. Don't go back and give the people the gift to embarrass them. You know, you accepted a gift, um, but you cannot use it because of your religious values. So we should try to dispose of it. About giving gifts, it is also permissible for us to give gifts to non-Muslims, to anybody. You know, giving gifts is one of the recommended things in Islam that we should try to build relationships. You know, and so Omar, for example, he gave a, a suit to his mushrik brother in Makkah. You know, so it is not. Um, but what the caveat is is that we should not give the gifts on the day when they are having their celebrations, because it may be interpreted that I'm, we are doing it as part of that celebration. So the scholars draw a line of saying, don't give them on the day itself, but you can give gifts generally. Greeting, that's another thing that we have to deal with in which people come up to us and say, Merry Christmas. Uh, and so if we answer back by saying Merry Christmas, then we are encouraging or condoning such. And so the scholars have mentioned that we should uh, find other ways to, to greet don't just ignore the greeting, but either change the topic or say, may God keep you guided and safe for the season or other ways of, um, you know, saying uh, something that does not show that you're endorsing the celebrating of Christmas. Then we have a lot of parties at Christmas time, you know, so... And most of the parties, unfortunately, they're not based on, you know, Christian values or religious values. A lot of time they are actually just drinking alcohol, excessive alcohol, uh, mixing of people, um, lewd behavior sometimes. You know, so it's it's Christmas parties are have become like very commercialized because the, the, the business community have hijacked Christmas literally. And so for Muslims... You know, um, we always have to be very careful about where we go and who we associate with. You know, Allah mentioned to us in the Quran, "La yashadu nazura wa idha marru bilagwa marru kirama," that you should not visit or or get close to places of where there's a lot of um, shahwat, like a lot of lag, a lot of you know, shameless and, and terrible actions that get performed and a nightclub and all of that. And when you pass by them, pass by with dignity and as quickly as possible. So we're always very careful not to get ourselves into places where, um, you know, the disobedience of Allah is taking place. Um, so generally, we try not to get involved in the parties. The scholars have made an exception for new Muslims because most of their families are Christians and usually... On Christmas Day, the family have a dinner. They invite all the families together. And so for dawah purposes, for the purposes of um, keeping the relationship with their families, the scholars have said that that new Muslim, whose family is sometimes the Muslim, the new Muslim, that's the only Muslim in their family is them. And all the whole family is non-Muslims. You know, and so... They said they should go and try to uh, behave in such a way that the light of Islam, the beauty of Islam by how they see your behavior will at least have an impact. And you participate and socialize and you be very careful in trying to keep away from the things which are like the prayer, which is saying Jesus Christ, Lord, or drinking the alcohol, the other, you know, practices that you might find mixed in in that party or that dinner. But you do the best you can. But they said it is, um, these are the scholars from the West because they understand the dynamic. The scholars from the East, they say it's haram to go to it because they, they don't have a 
cultural context to understand. You're telling a new Muslim, you got to keep away from their whole family in the time when all their family is meeting. You know, so here's where you have a fatwa that sometimes don't take into consideration the true reality of what is happening. But the scholars in the West have said it's okay and it's actually recommended sometimes, depending upon your circumstance, that you should go and be able to, you know, you'll be able to let them see what a Muslim looks like and how they behave and so on. Uh, putting up the Christmas tree, we talked about that. It has nothing to do with Christianity or Islam. Don't go cutting down trees and putting them in your houses. Um, putting up decorations also. Uh, it's Decorations as a principle is nothing wrong with decorating your place. But you don't want to give the picture um, of decorating in the time of Christmas where you see, you're seen and considered as, as celebrating Christmas or imitating Christians. Uh, and so in their in their religious celebrations. So it's perhaps better to avoid doing it. It's not considered haram, but it will be under like makru, you know, um, category. Um, the kids is a tough one because Christmas is kids. You know, everything about Christmas is to entice kids. You know, so in school, kids have projects, which they they this. Now they're trying to phase out all kinds of religious practices in school, but still some exist. Um, you have Halloween projects, you have um, you have national projects, but religious projects is slowly phasing out, but they still do in Ramadan, for example. Teacher me in the lower levels uh, have a Ramadan project and Christmas project and so on. Um, if the kids can't avoid it, then you do the best you can, but generally sometimes very difficult to not participate in that project if you're going to public school. Um, you should educate your kids about Santa Claus so they don't have that desire to go lining up in the malls for Santa Claus. And you should not send mixed message by buying them huge gifts at Christmas, buy an extra special gift at Eid so they know Eid is our holiday. Education is the best way to deal with children, letting them know we have our own way of life and it's different. You know, so these are some of the different perspectives and things about Christmas. It is really a tough one, as I began with, that very emotional, a lot of people. And so um, if you do have relatives and friends who are um, Muslims who you see have a Christmas tree, I think please don't go about you know, harassing them and um, thinking that we are better than them. You know, it's all a process of education. But from what I've tried to explain to you, it's really not sensible and it's not, because it's not even a holiday that is based on any religious foundation. So why would you want to go and participate in something like that? And if you're attached, remember the ayah that it may be that you love something that is bad for you and you hate something that is good for you. You know, So Allah knows that we don't. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to uh, navigate this very difficult holiday and uh, to remain intact with our deen and try to um, survive it, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum.